Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second listening session for our monumental ALX project. Tonight's topic is housing, schools, and community benefits. And we're uh, delighted to have so many of our neighbors joining us to hear from our panelists. Um, as a reminder, the way that these sessions are structured, we provide a little bit of very sort of basic background information and then really spend the bulk of the time uh, answering questions that have been pre-submitted by the community on the topic, but also we have the ability to take live questions through the question and answer chat. We will try to answer as many questions as possible in the hour time frame, but please also know that we are capturing all comments and questions and will be um, issuing sort of written responses um, as soon as possible. For those who tuned in last week, we're still finalizing. Uh, you had lots of questions last week and we're still finalizing all of the uh, answers and feedback to that and hope to be getting that out very shortly. And so tonight I'd like to start with uh, an introduction of our two key listeners here tonight, uh, representing the city of Alexandria and the Alexandria City Public Schools. So uh, first up, city manager Perjan, you're on mute, so. Or why don't we go to Dr. Page while the city manager gets off mute? Sure. Uh, glad to be here tonight representing uh, Alexandria City Public Schools uh, to listen and learn. Thank you so much. Great. Okay, and we also, uh, here we go. So, sorry about that, a little technology. Uh, I'm Jim Perijan. I'm really fortunate to serve as the city's uh, city manager, and I'm really very excited about uh, and appreciative of your time tonight and sharing your thoughts on a couple key topics as we uh, look to uh, have this project considered by our city council in the future. So thank you. Great. Um, so next up, uh, our first slide is just a reminder of the listening session. So last week we did financial proposal and economic impact. Tonight, schools, housing and community benefits. Next week, we'll be talking transportation and traffic management and the following week, small business and economic opportunity. I'll also mention that should there be other topics that emerge as we continue to discuss this project, we can certainly continue this series. So tonight's panel is representative of a number of uh, community partners, both on site and who will be involved um, as and if this project proceeds. So I am going to, in alphabetical order, let our partners introduce themselves, starting with Lauren. Hi, good evening. I'm Lauren Augustine, the Associate Director of Government and Community Relations with Virginia Tech. I am a Hokie alum and a city resident, so I'm excited to be participating and listening tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Next up, Jeff. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm Jeff Farner. I'm Deputy Director of the Planning Department, and one of my roles and responsibilities is overseeing long-range planning, including small area plans that include Potomac Yard, and I've had the chance to work with many of you as part of that process. So look forward to questions and comments tonight. Great. One of our newer uh, potential partners is Crispus. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, Crispus Gordon III, Director of Government Relations and Community Affairs for Monumental Sports and Entertainment. Uh, in my role at MSC, I'm responsible for all of the political engagement, government engagement, community engagement for our teams, as well as the uh, corporate side. I have you. And next up, AJ. Hi, I'm AJ Jackson with JBG Smith. I lead social impact investing here at JBG Smith and focus on our workforce and affordable housing uh, efforts. And last but not least, Helen. Hi, good evening. I'm Helen McElvain, and I'm the city's housing director. And I'm very pleased to be here tonight to uh, uh, be part of the presentation about this exciting opportunity. But I'm also here to listen to you, answer questions uh, if I can, and um, uh, assure you that uh, central to the city's uh, housing policy and investments have been uh, making sure that we have housing uh, for to support our economic development and growth. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, great. Let's go through um, just a couple of place setting slides. 
Um, we'll have this slide available uh, as and if we answer questions that are related to uses, and um, we believe that this is a good contextual slide. But the project, uh, the monumental project that we're talking about is the opportunity to develop what we call in the planning world, North Potomac Yard. And so that is what you see here on this map. For context, you see the Virginia Tech Innovation Campus up to the uh, left-hand corner. And then over uh, as you move south, uh, the potential arena project is outlined in red. That would be owned and operated by a new sports and entertainment authority and would include an arena, a performing arts venue, and uh, a wizard's practice facility, office space, and a lot of open space. And one of the reasons that we are considering this project as a city is because this catalyst would then allow for the development of the rest of the properties that you see highlighted on this site. In light blue, which is phase one, in green and yellow, which are medium term, and in the darker blue, long term. And so we're going to have, uh, I'm sure, some questions. We, we have some questions already submitted about the mixture of uses, what, uh, what type of housing, school opportunities, what does this mean for the future growth of Virginia Tech, et cetera. So we'll come back to the slide um, as appropriate throughout the evening. Uh, our next slide, let's talk a little bit about the performance venue. Um, this is a unique opportunity for the city to participate in bringing what we um, have done in many other parts of our community, a cultural asset that could be used by both the community, but also the arts community, and uh, to provide a very unique entertainment uh, space in Alexandria. The way that this proposal has been structured the city would own this venue and would pay to build it in partnership with Monumental Sports. Monumental would then run the facility, but as part of our arrangement, there would be opportunities for community gathering and some special events uh, very unique to the city. Again, everything that we are talking about last week, tonight, as we move forward, is still very conceptual. And so some of the numbers that we're sharing around capacity are, are again concepts. Um, if, if this project moves forward, there will be a detailed entitlement process during which the community can talk through the specifics about the size and shape, et cetera. And that's when we would really come down to very clearly what the capacity is. So I just wanna say that as I explain this performance venue, but the concept is that it would seat, uh, it would be flexibly designed to seat anywhere between 4,000 and 8,000 people, depending on what sort of event was happening at the space. It would also be designed to be able to flex outside. So you can see here in this schematic, the majority of the facility is an interior sort of performance hall, but it does have the ability to have, say, a small band playing on the outside for, for certain events. And so think about something before a con before a larger concert or, um, or a sporting event next door in the arena, you could have almost like a pregame um, concert. Uh, but it also could be a place where you could imagine poetry readings happening uh, on a weekend. And so the idea here is to program this uh, both to, to create opportunities to generate activities, vibrancy, and revenue, uh, but also this would be a unique venue of a size and scale that we don't currently have in the city. And there are a number of city events that we currently can't host in Alexandria to include our very own high school graduation. And so the way that this joint venture would be structured, the city would have access to the facility a certain number of times a, a year for certain types of events and celebrations. We're also, as we work on putting together this concept, exploring the idea that Alexandria-based groups could have some sort of discount. And so we would very much appreciate lots of um, lots of your ideas or thoughts on this uh, opportunity, the specific part of the opportunity as we move forward. And then finally, I just uh, thought this was a good time to remind our community that we have a really great partner in Visit Alexandria. Uh, part of what they do is uh, they have a sales team and their sales team takes calls, but also generates uh, calls from conventions and private events and meetings who like to come to a, a beautiful place like Alexandria and bring their business. And this would be considered a new asset for that team to be able to promote and, and sell. Uh, so next up, let's. Uh, this is just a, a visual of what that. Uh, if you could go back one slide, please. This is a visual of what the performance venue might look like if you were standing on the metro, looking west, 
uh, towards uh, US1, the uh, arena on your right and the performance venue on your left, uh, surrounded by really great open spaces. Next slide. Um, this is, uh, when we talk about schools, I think people's first thoughts are really about our K through 12 system. And that certainly, uh, there is a, there is a, literal place and role for um, for our school system here in North Potomac Yard. But we also have a really incredible uh, other educational partner in Virginia Tech who is building, as you see down here to the bottom right, building the first building in an innovation campus right here on North Potomac Yard. This first building will open in spring of 2025. And one of the things that we wanna talk about tonight is how this project could and, and would impact Virginia Tech's planned growth and what sort of partnerships uh, they are considering as part of the entertainment district. Um, and so then let's just go back then to the map slide and we'll get into the questions. And so we'll start with um, a, a lot of the questions, sort of baseline questions we, uh, we received were about housing and mix of uses. And so we thought we'd maybe start with uh, with Jeff Farner to talk to us a little bit about what sort of uses uh, are approved in this plan and what sort of what, what we would call community benefits, everything from school and open spaces, uh, will we start to see should this development move forward? Yeah, first of all, thank you for that question. And um, many of you probably recall that this is a site that has been undergoing planning and redevelopment conversations since really almost 2008. Uh, and this retail shopping center, uh, as it sits, is an area that we as a community, we as a city have talked about adding uh, redevelopment and density, uh, which drove the conversation around our metro station. We've talked about a mix of uses. Uh, we've even talked about entertainment use as part of that planning process more broadly and how do we have civic uses and um, some of those entertainment perhaps uses within North Potomac Yard. Um, we also talked about the need for adequate infrastructure. Um, and one of the things you see in the bottom right is a reservation for a potential school site. Um, and that would be, there's a condition that actually requires that to be dedicated to the city for a school or, or other civic or community uses, um, including uh, the potential of a portion of that site to be used for affordable housing. We've also talked with the community about the need for open space and open space connectivity. Um, also, one of the things we talked a lot about during that planning process was having a civic gathering area at our metro station, the new Potomac Yard metro station, um, connectivity uh, for all users, bike, ped, and cars, and introducing a new grid of streets here, um, and also having retail that could serve not only Potomac Yard, but the city as a whole. And so lots of conversations about different uses, and I think part of the conversation tonight is how we um, accommodate some of these ideas and vision for this area and hear from the community about um, how some of this fits into the, the overall plan for Potomac Yard. So uh, thank you for that question. Sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, so maybe I would ask uh, the next set of questions are around housing and anticipated um, how we would think about housing production on this site. Um, and maybe I'll ask AJ and Helen to both take um, um, take a, 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 a shot at answering this question. Um, we anticipate that after the arena and performance venue and other associated um, development on the east side of Potomac Avenue goes underway, starts underway, phase one would begin uh, relatively shortly thereafter. That's the way that this uh, proposal is being structured. And in phase one, there are a number of uh, multifamily buildings, but also hotels and other uses. As we think about all of the site building out, tell us a little bit about how I guess uh, AJ first and then maybe Helen, how we would think about 
what sort of housing units might be built here. Um, and then Helen can talk to us about how we approach affordable housing when development proposals come forward and, um, and also what other revenues might be generated on this site for housing purposes. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so on the site, on the site itself, across the sort of uh, three phases of development, there are a little bit more than 5,000 units of uh, housing contemplated, and that's a mix of, um, of sizes and types. So everything from studios and one bedrooms to a significant amount of two and two and three bedroom units. And our anticipation um, at, at, at present is that based on the type of development that would uh, that would occur here, which would be sort of lower rise uh, uh, multifamily development, that generally you're you're talking about um, you know kind of kind of workforce moderate income rents uh, for those uh, for that housing that's developed across um, across the Potomac Yards uh, site. And in addition, the development on the site, you mentioned that, that it's not just housing, but it's obviously hotel and other, other uses. Uh, the development on the site actually um, triggers around $25 million in affordable housing contribution uh, as, as well that goes uh, into the city's uh, housing trust fund and, and can be used uh, to provide uh, affordable housing across the city and support, support various, various projects across, uh, across the city. But separate and apart from from what's going on on site, um, I just I wanted to, to mention something that we at JBG Smith have, have been working on. I think as, as several folks know, for a long time we've been focused on preserving the affordability and diversity in the communities where we're developing. Going back to 2018, uh, we created something called the Impact Pool that enables nonprofits and mission-focused housing providers to create committed affordable housing um, in neighborhoods where there's development pressure. Um, and it's a, it's a mixed income, zero displacement approach that uses really our expertise and private capital that we've, that, that we've raised uh, to help communities address displacement and affordability ahead of new development. Um, I think some folks will recall that actually in 2020, we worked with the city um, in the wake of the uh, Amazon HQ2 announcement uh, to help Alexandria Housing, which is a local nonprofit, acquire 323 units in Shirlington and preserve 75% of those set aside as, as affordable housing. So we want to do something similar here in conjunction with the creation of the Arena District. And so we're committing to use the impact pool and our, our social impact platform to preserve an additional 500 units of affordable workforce housing in the city of Alexandria. Uh, to, again, to try to get ahead of, of pressures around displacement um, and, and affordability. That's separate and apart from anything that will be, be built on site. And that allows us to deliver uh, affordability as development comes online and really get ahead of some of the, on some of the uh, on-site uh, activity. So we're excited about that um, as well as about the opportunity uh, to build new housing on site, to make significant contribution to the Housing Production Trust Fund and to continue to work, work with the city. Great. And I'll just say, um, we're very, very excited at uh, the opportunity to partner with JBG Smith again. Parkstone has been a, an amazing um, addition to our portfolio of uh, affordable and workforce housing. And uh, really, uh, we're, we're, we're uh, very, uh, very excited at the opportunity to uh, do something similar again. Um, I will say that the very first building uh, that was built in Potomac Yard was a brand new uh, affordable housing building. It's above the fire station, and it was the city's first opportunity to use the tax credit program, which is a very uh, well-used uh, vehicle to finance affordable housing. And since that time, we've added to the stock, not only in the Potomac Yard area, but all around uh, this part of the city. So we have the station at Potomac Yard, we have Jackson Crossing across the street, we have what we call set aside units in many of the existing rental buildings uh, that you see in Potomac Yard already, and that's a, a handful of units that are affordable uh, in each building. We also have affordable senior housing plus care units in a new development. We have uh, nine new affordable home ownership units in the Dillon condominium. So we have over time uh, been able to both negotiate through the development process and build with partners a number of affordable housing resources. In the larger area, we've been very focused on um, 
first of all, making sure that housing that exists in uh, the Arlandria Chiralagua area is preserved. And so uh, we've worked with partners like Wesley and Housing Alexandria that, uh, that AJ mentioned uh, to preserve several of the uh, apartment buildings as committed affordable housing. Uh, the square at 511 is one with nearly 200 units. Um, and then we also have a partner in the CLI Community Lodgings that has a development approval to uh, transform its current 28 unit property to almost 100 units. So we have an awful lot of things both actively underway and then in our pipeline. The biggest project of all is a project in the Arlandria area at the intersection of Mount Vernon and Glebe that is uh, just began construction and at the end will deliver uh, 471 units. Uh, 60 of those will be um, home ownership units and the rest will be affordable and workforce um, housing, including 25% that are deeply affordable at the 40% AMI level. So we are, uh, affordable housing is very top of mind in terms of our, our overall uh, development plan. And obviously we would be looking at this, Jeff mentioned that we have a, a dedication of land for a project of up to 150 units uh, that we're excited to, uh, to uh, undertake in a few years. So uh, we, we are constantly looking at opportunities. Uh, we have a pipeline of projects that uh, will benefit by uh, the money that's talked about. And I think the other thing that's very important when we look at a, something that's an entertainment district and a place venues where food will be served is that 1% um, of the city's restaurant meals tax, uh, it goes to affordable housing as dedicated funds. That's currently about $6 million a year. And imagine when this project would be built out, be much higher number. Stephanie might have an idea. So thank you. Uh, th yeah, thank you for that note, Helen. In our uh, projections, and I'm glad you said we currently uh, bring in six million dollars a year. In our projections, this project alone will bring fifty to sixty million dollars in that in that one percent dedicated meals tax for affordable housing um, over the course of the term. So that is a significant would be a significant um, increase to that that fund. Um, Jeff, we're getting a number of questions about how much housing will be built. And I'm not asking you to give me a number, but can you explain how um, how the plan envisioned what uses could go where? Mm -hmm. So uh, generally, this is an area because of the metro and because of the scale of the site. This is an area that uh, was always envisioned to be pretty high density. Uh, and AJ alluded to some numbers. And um, like you, we're early in this process of looking at number of the units. But this is high density. We also talked about commercial uses generally around the metro station. And as you get farther away, residential uses um, uh, also medium to high density being in Potomac Yard. And also, I think the other important thing, and Stephanie uh, alluded to this, is this is a larger site. So this is going to happen over time and, and it will happen in phases. And I think that's how we've always talked about the redevelopment of this site or redevelopment of any large site in our city. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. It will be in phases. And how do we implement redevelopment in, in a phased way that makes sense? Um, Helen, there are some questions about, um, you know, how many units at a, at a certain percentage of AMI would be on site. And again, I you can't answer that question right now, but perhaps you can share how we go about um, figuring that out, negotiating the, those uh, levels and numbers. Sure, glad to do that. And I'm glad you you gave that caveat because obviously very early in the process. But typically, um, the city is very focused on um, housing that is affordable for households at 60% of the area median income and below, because we know that is uh, our, our, our greatest unmet need. And so those would be families, our area median income is about $150,000 a year. So those would be households that are at 60% of that. And um, and it's of course based on the, the household size. Um, so uh, roughly folks who are maybe uh, 60, 70, $80,000 um, uh, in income. 
Uh, we also, of course, in recent years have invested to create units that are more affordable because we know that many families uh, work in, uh, in jobs or in industries very much needed. Uh, think of childcare, think of CNAs, think of folks who are in our retail and hospitality sectors uh, who, who make less than that. And so we're very concerned about them being able to also live where they work and support our local and regional economy. Uh, we've also become worried about creating opportunities for people who uh, need a little bit of help because otherwise it would be very difficult for them to have housing choice. So I know uh, AJ has mentioned workforce and that's an increasingly important uh, priority for us and for our city council that we have a housing supply that's affordable at all price points uh, along the spectrum. So while it's too early to say what the mix will be, I think we would have um, a, a large number at 60 and at 50% AMI, uh, probably 10 to 20% at 40% AMI, and then some component that would be uh, affordable at, uh, at the up to 80%. And uh, I mentioned that we have had, uh, we're, we're supporting uh, a nonprofit that's doing a, an affordable home ownership project. We have a very long-term legacy um, first time home buyer. And there we see folks who are typically uh, 70 to about 100% of the area, area median income. So we try to have some options and solutions for every everyone. Um, and I think we could expect to see something like that here. Great. And I, while I have you, Helen, there are a couple questions about how, um, how do we make sure that those um, home ownership opportunities are um, stay affordable? Um, and any other tools that we use um, beyond creation to maintain the affordability in units? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so it's very important uh, to us that when we get something through the development process or through city investment, that we have assurances about long-term committed affordability. Uh, typically that's at least 40 years. And so we have restrictive uh, covenants when we have a home ownership um, uh, opportunity. And that means that um, at every sale, it is sold subject to it being affordable to someone in the same income range the next time. And we, we sort of have a, what's called a shared equity model, where some of the appreciation comes back to the city and some goes to the home buyer. We also want people to obviously be accumulating wealth through uh, the home ownership opportunity. Uh, and of course, with our rental housing, uh, when we put money in, the expectation is that um, certainly if it's a nonprofit that over uh, really sort of affordability and perpetuity, but uh, at least 40 years. So again, we really look at long-term affordability and some of our nonprofits are uh, both uh, willing and eager to commit to longer periods. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, there's a question about whether the master plan has been updated. Uh, you mentioned a start date, I think in 2007 and it, that it was updated. Can you can you talk a little bit about um, how, how often we update mas master plans um, and, and when this one was last updated? Yeah, so um, good question. So this is, as uh, Stephanie pointed out, this is North Potomac Yard and it is a small area plan. Uh, the arena and perhaps some of the other elements as part of this would require a plan amendment. Um, and that's, I think, the conversation uh, that's being had with the city and the community right now. Uh, so that is a process and, and that is part of these conversations that are happening right now. Um, I also want to uh, say I, I saw some of the questions about um, what were any of these uses envisioned by the plan? And I did want to clarify that as part of the North Potomac Yard plan, there were community facilities envisioned. In fact, it references a, a performing arts theater. There's actually a condition that requires a monetary contribution of the property owner uh, to implement that. Uh, the arena, I think, is is different. And that's why I think part of this conversation and uh, that's being had with the the city and the community at this point. So I just wanted to clarify that comment as well. So thank you. Um, so Lauren, some questions about how um, how this project or this proposal impacts Virginia Tech's vision for the innovation campus. 
Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, as your opening slide showed and, and this this picture shows, Virginia Tech may not be a part of the deal, but we are the next door neighbor. And this kind of sports and entertainment district is an exciting opportunity to see industry, education, and community come together as part of the tech ecosystem envisioned when the innovation campus was first imagined. Um, for example, we were excited to hear mention at the announcement, a desire to build the most state-of-the-art stadium with ultimate user experience. Two of the main research areas at Virginia Tech Innovation Campus could help complement that vision. The Singani Center for Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning, uh, which is one of the most preeminent centers in the country, could help boost sports and entertainment analytics capabilities. Um, and then we also have the Intelligent Interfaces team, which could really focus on how to make that user experience top notch. So very exciting opportunities to come, and we're looking forward to potential partnerships that could come out of this. Crispus, um, can you talk to us a little bit about what community benefits or, or sort of um, uh, how Monumental is thinking about plugging into our community and maybe some of the things that you currently do uh, in the community that you operate in? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. I mean, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, one of the uh, things that uh, Tia Leonza talks about all the time, the double bottom line. Um, of course, we are a business. Uh, of course, we have to you know, drive revenue. But driving revenues without having a true and authentic corporate responsibility just invalidates the former. Uh, and so we focus on, focus on both. Uh, and I'll give you a few examples of what we have done at Capital One Arena and in, um, and in Washington, D.C., uh, first and foremost, uh, we looked at Look many at small businesses uh, in D.C., uh, and we took them to Capital One Arena and gave them uh, space on the concourse during a Wizards game in order to promote themselves and sell their product. Uh, and if you know anything about space um, at an arena or a stadium, everything is being sold for, you know, for revenue purposes. We said it's beyond revenue for that. Uh, we need to ensure that we have women-owned businesses. We need to ensure we have small businesses, Black-owned businesses, give them the opportunity to interface with a diverse audience at the particular arena. Uh, and then people found out what they would do. They would purchase the items there, particularly Mahogany Bookstore from Ward 8 in Southeast DC, purchase the items there and actually find out more about this particular business. That was a source of pride uh, for our organization. One of the other things we do is with our theme nights. And so I'll use the military theme night, for example. Uh, traditionally, theme nights are when, you know, we look at the schedule and we'll just say on this particular date for this particular game, here's a theme night. But we went beyond that. Uh, for military theme night, we hosted the Hoops for uh, All-Stars for um, soldiers at Fort Belvoir. Uh, so that was bringing them not just to come to Capital One Arena to watch a game, but actually play it on the court. And so those are the type of things that we try to incorporate in our corporate responsibility to plan to show that we're a good neighbor. And I'm a firm believer in, you know, seeing what you have already done in the past it's indicating what you'll do in the future. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a few questions about the, the school site um, and what kind of questions about what kind of school it might be and what's the timing for delivery. And so um, I'll sort of start by saying a lot to be determined, um, but maybe uh, Jeff, can you tell us a little bit about the the, the vision and commitment for um, within the plan to create an opportunity for a school here? Yeah, so good question. The, the current approval requires that the site be dedicated to the city for school use by 2027. Um, and the site that's shown in yellow um, is on Route 1, adjacent to some of the existing buildings, just to orient everyone. And we are actively working with ACPS on types of facilities and timing of location. But the key is that that site would come to ACPS in the city for public use. And when and how that school looks like and when it's constructed will be in coordinate with ACPS and our city council. Um, and it's also important to note that other um, potential community facilities and, and or affordable housing uh, could be adjacent to the, the school itself. So... Good Great. question, and hopefully that answers all your questions. Uh, well, I have a follow-up question for Lauren. Um, when Virginia Tech um, made their announcement to come to the city, there was some talk about how Virginia Tech might partner with ACPS on on various things. Can you tell us a little bit about um, maybe what, what you've done so far and if you see an opportunity for Virginia Tech to be involved in, in whatever kind of school might come to fruition on site here? 
Yes, thank you for that question. As you mentioned, Virginia Tech is already partnering with ACPS to make sure that all students, elementary through high school, have the opportunity to engage and learn about STEM opportunities. Uh, and this potential new school certainly only allows for even more partnership and opportunities. We do a lot of exciting things like robotics camps, drone camps. We've got a drone soccer team. Uh, we do weekend STEM, weekend STEM encounters and STEM nights at schools. All of that has the potential here and even more given the proximity to our innovation campus. Right. And Crispus, um, do you currently uh, do any work with uh, public school system? Is that something, uh, is there a role you think for Monumental to play um, if there were a school site adjacent? Absolutely. Uh, my mother right now is logged on as, as one of the folks asking questions and she's a retired teacher, so I better say yes. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> but no, we definitely, uh, we work we work with the school systems, um, particularly in D.C., but also in the surrounding areas as well. Uh, and so I'll give you this example. We work with the school system and the library system. We already have a great relationship with the library in Alexandria, in Arlington, in Fairfax County, in Prince George's County, uh, Maryland. We have always looked at ourselves as a regional sports group. And so this particular expansion to Northern Virginia is only going to enhance our corporate responsibility and social responsibility footprint that touch a number of people we may not have been, ha not, may not have been touching uh, previously. So various partnerships with school system could look like having open, pra open practices for students to come. Currently at the Capital facility in Boston, the practices are open. We've had a number of uh, children who have come there uh, to watch Ovechkin you know, practice on any given day. Those are the type of partnerships we see growing uh, with this particular project in Northern Virginia. Great. Um, so I see some questions here about um, imp potential impact of this project on existing housing stock and existing housing values. Um, and I know that this is um, certainly something that we um, continue, you know, he hear a lot when we are creating new economic drivers throughout the city and the region. I know, AJ, you mentioned earlier um, JBG Smith's role in some in preservation. Um, and you also shared news about or, or, or some information about a commitment. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of those preservation efforts and how those specifically are structured to to deal with with this dynamic of creating value, but also protecting affordability in existing housing? Absolutely. Thank you. So, that, yeah, that's really kind of the core of what our, uh, our affordable workforce housing strategy is about. That Again, we know as development comes to areas that can create pressures on rents, pressures on housing stock. And so the, the way that our platform works is we'll, we'll partner with nonprofit and other mission-driven housing providers to help them acquire and operate existing housing stock with a commitment to maintain affordability in that housing stock, and then as necessary to make investments in it so that we know that the condition of the housing is, is what, you know, is what everyone would want, where we would all be, you know, comfortable and, and, and proud to live. Uh, but the goal is to really try to, again, get ahead of some of those pressures, lock in the affordability so that we can maintain the vibrancy and, and diversity in the communities around, uh, around development. Uh, and, and mitigate some of the some of the displacement pressures that would otherwise be there. So we've done that across the region. Again, starting in Alexandria uh, with the Parkstone Project in Charlottetown, but around the region um, over over the last uh, three and a half four years or so, and have, and have helped uh, nonprofits and other mission partners to uh, to to install committed affordability across 3,000 units. And so, uh, doing something here is 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 uh, is exciting. I noticed there was a question about about funding. And I just want to reiterate, this is something that JBG does with a with a fund that we have raised and with expertise that we have in-house in partnership with cities and nonprofits. So this is this is uh, in addition to or outside of any sort of on-site housing. And this is not a situation of using, you know, the the um the the dollars committed as a result of development to do uh to do this this preservation. Uh, and Potomac Arts this is again something that we can roll out um, you know, as soon as the the uh, arena authority is created, uh, and start to try to get get ahead of some of those those pressures. Um, I, I saw a question uh, asking for clarification on something I said about the fifty to sixty million dollars uh, that we have modeled will be generated for the affordable housing. Um, dedicated to affordable housing by meals tax. The term is the 35-year term of the lease 
for uh, Monumental to use this facility. So it would be um, that amount of money would be uh, raised for the city as part of the meals tax. Um, Jeff, there are some questions on here about parking um, and how much parking would be built on the site. And again, um, I know it's way too early for you to give us um, a number, but perhaps you can talk a little bit about how we think about parking in uh, at an urban district like this. I'll start by just clarifying that the, the arena and uh, monumental campus proposal includes the construction of a 2,500 space underground parking facility, a public parking facility that would be used um, certainly by people coming to concerts and events, but also would, would operate as a public parking garage uh, throughout other times of the day, week, year. But uh, how else as development happens, uh, how, how do we think about or how does the city think about parking um, for uses in a place, in a plan like this? Yeah, I'll talk generally, and obviously um, we're not at the point to understand exact numbers or, or even location or circulation route, and I think that's probably part of one of your upcoming meetings as we think about this site as well, but um, one is the amount, two is access, how people are getting to and from the parking, and three is location to make sure that as we're accommodating parking, it also fits into North Potomac Yard, but also fits into our city. Um, so whether it's structured parking or underground parking, all of those are things that uh, we generally look at with new development. And I think as we move through this process, I think would be helpful in hearing from the community about, about all of this. So um, we're just not there yet, but um, that's something that hopefully we get to talk about as part of the future meeting. Great. Um, I know the city manager is listening, but I'm gonna put him on the spot and ask him a question kind of related to public safety. Um, there's some questions about um, yeah, potential crime coming with a use like this, um, people, um, you know, loitering, et cetera. And so uh, questioners want to know what sort of public safety, um, I guess, plan improvements uh, levels are associated with a project like this and, and how do we pay for those? Great. Well, that's, that's a good question. Uh, a couple of things. Again, I, I would caution you, this is not just an arena. This is a, a mixed use project that's got corporate headquarters. It's got uh, retail, it's got residential. It's a place for really, frankly, for people to live as well. So, um, you know, we do expect that uh, there are elements that we wanna be sure that we have a very strong public safety plan. Um, I've had a chance to work in projects similar to this in the past and the way those the way we would operate that is is that we develop uh, through an agreement with uh, Monumental Sports Entertainment and the authority, a public safety and service plan. Uh, and that's intended to draw uh, all the necessary resources from around the region as a as part of secondary employment for particularly our public safety uh, apparatus. Um, at the same time, making sure that there is no impact whatsoever to the ability for us to serve uh, our community as fully as fully as we would plan to do without this project uh, for the 15 square miles of the city. So uh, the good news is in our region, we have a very significant um, qualified workforce that, that does this. Uh, and we would deploy that in a regional manner to provide uh, a really good public safety and service uh, for the entire project, but it would be through a uh, established written agreement uh, that establishes uh, both the obligations of the city, the obligations of the authority, obligations of monumental sports and entertainment. Um, and that would be in writing and uh, the cost structure of that would be paid for out of uh, revenues and um, um, funds that are generated by the project. Um, and those are models that have, have existed elsewhere in many uh, sports and entertainment districts. Um, and I, it's a model that's, that, that does work very effectively, but most importantly, it makes sure that a city like ours does not sacrifice any public safety element whatsoever for the rest of our community. Thank you. Um, 
Helen or or Jeff, um, there are a couple questions about how many families we anticipate would be living here, which again is not a question that either of you are prepared to answer because we don't have um, a proposal of what types of units. But can you tell us how we do evaluate that um, when when specific kind of building proposals come forward? Yeah. So one of the things that we look at is uh, we look at potential. Um, impacts with new development is we look at occupancy rates and we look at student generation rates for new development. And uh, we work with our partners at HCPS uh, for student generation rates. Um, and we meet every year uh, on student generation rates with our, our partners in ACPS to make sure that as we're forecasting the, the number of students um, that we are doing that essentially citywide to make sure we're forecasting that correctly for new schools. Um, also in terms of occupancy, it varies by building type, um, but generally as sort of a good rule of thumb, um, 1.1 to 1.5 people per multifamily unit. Um, and it, it definitely varies, but as a good rule of thumb, I think that's sort of a good rule of thumb as we use in our planning process. Um, Jeff, this is probably also for you. Um, there's a question about some needed infrastructure improvements in Potomac Yard, specifically, um, this questioner would like permanent bathrooms in Potomac Yard Park um, to replace porta potties. <laughs> um, and so um, the question is about how this plan addresses infrastructure needed. And um, and I'll let you answer, and then I might be able to add something specific as well. Sure. So um, that is a um, that is a conversation. So one of the things that we need to have as part of this process is the ultimate design of the parks for Potomac Yard, and um, the community will be engaged in that process. And um, public restrooms are something that comes up quite a lot, and so. I encourage you to to stay involved in that process. So that's going to be that's going to involve the community. Um, also, infrastructure. I think generally, I think it's important to point out that when um, approvals go to city council on this application or other applications of this size, there are generally triggers of at this time a road or a park or a school or other things need to happen. So those are things that we condition developers as part of the overall approval that ultimately goes to the Planning Commission and City Council. So there will be triggers um, and uh, on the park, um, stay tuned and um, we're happy to have you and other people involved in, in our park design conversations. Great. Um, I was just going to add that there is, as part of the uh, financing for the entire project, there are a significant number of on-site infrastructure um, improvements planned to include public spaces, public park spaces, uh, roadways, streetscapes, et cetera. Um, there was a question early on I saw about um, an existing bike path that has just been built on the um, east side of the site. Uh, Jeff, do you know if that will stay in place um, given this development or um, any thoughts on that question? I think that's something we're still looking at, but we understand the importance of bike circulation north, south, and east, west. So that that's something we will, we will definitely be looking at. Great. Um, so I saved a couple of these questions here at the end because it was a little awkward because I'm going to ask them and I think I'm the one who's going to answer them, but they're about the about the performance uh, venue and facility. Um, and so uh, we we got some questions about whether local bands and theaters and choirs would um, would have access to the facility and what the process will look like. And, and then also uh, about what types of events are going to be hosted at that venue versus sort of the arena and during off season times. And so I'll just um, I'll sort of um, say uh, on the slide that I presented, I mentioned that we are, we're currently exploring the idea of an Alexandria based sort of discount program. Uh, we very much do see this as a community uh, uh, asset and venue. We also, though, very much need and want this to be a active 
uh, facility that generates revenue. Um, that is the, you know, the intent is for us to have cultural events and concerts and book signings and other things that I mentioned. And so there will be a balance between events that the city can program that don't really generate revenue, things like graduations or community celebrations where there aren't tickets sold um, and there aren't necessarily, you know, sort of vending and things like that. Um, we want a, we want to have a healthy number of those events while also preserving the opportunity to, to you know to program it and make money off of the venue. Um, and so I think my my general message is stay, stay tuned, but also continue to submit your ideas on that front. Uh, the the venue size again is four thousand to eight thousand, and it is filling a niche that is currently not filled within within the city. Um, so. Uh, there's also a question, a couple of questions on here about um, new funding for ACPS for teachers and education, et cetera. Um, and anyone is willing to, to chime in on this, but I will say that um, to, to that to that point, not just for teachers, but also for all of the other things that the city pays for, one of the reasons that we are considering this opportunity is because the catalytic impact of bringing the entertainment district actually jumpstarts development, which generates revenue, for, general revenue for the city uh, at a much faster pace than would happen otherwise, given the market and given current lease obligations. And um, as much as the uh, our school system is a major um, investment that the city budget invests in every single year, the more money and revenue generated for the city, the more money and revenue potentially available for um, operational um, school portions. So, or um, portions of the of the school's budget. Um, looking through here, just. Uh, Give me one minute to catch up and see if hey, more. I think while you're yeah. doing on sure. that uh, with the, that question about uh, the value, I think you did a great job explaining, you know, the commercial growth and how that helps us uh, from a fiscal standpoint. But also the school side is really important too because that affects uh, and extends our ability to uh, manage our capital program, which is our larger, bigger projects, uh, including the school school facilities and upgrades. So that is that is also a, a big deal. And as Jeff uh, pointed out, uh, that's a reservation of a school site. Uh, so the uh, cost to acquire the land uh, is already taken care of. We don't have to add that into our capital improvement plan. So, so that helps us significantly, especially in Alexandria where uh, land prices are expensive in this region. Thank you for adding. Uh, so it looks like we've covered um, a majority of the questions that have been submitted. Um, there, uh, I guess maybe a general theme that I'm seeing uh, that maybe is a, a good way to wrap this up is there are a lot of questions about why, why things are to be determined, why we're not going to know things for a while. And so I'll, I'll step back and sort of remind our community of the process. Right now, we're talking about this opportunity, this concept to bring an entertainment district to Alexandria. And if we decide to move forward with this, there will then be a very detailed um, uh, and uh, all of the details that we're talking about will be discussed in a variety of public meetings, review, uh, documents will be available as buildings get designed, streets get designed, schools get designed, et cetera. Um, but we can't really get to that part where we're designing and answering all those details until we decide as a community if we want to proceed forward with this opportunity. And so we're trying to host these conversations so that we can hear the concerns, um, so that we can receive ideas and we can still shape the project as it moves from concept and framework to plans um, plans and permits and, and decisions. And so that is why we can't give definitive answers on number of units or number of parking spaces or how many families and, and children, um, but we wanna be able to, to explain how we evaluate those things and the process that we will follow as the project proceeds. So that's, um, so that's just sort of a reminder on timeline and process. With that, 
I think, um, as I stated at the beginning of the meeting, uh, we will take, we will download all of the questions that were asked. And so if, if your specific question was not um, uh, asked or answered directly, please know that we will be collating them and providing written answers over the coming days. Um, and we will be sure to share that with everyone who was here. If we can go to the last slide, I just wanna highlight a couple of additional engagement opportunities this week. So on Saturday, City Council will be hosting a town hall on this topic. Council members will answer submitted community questions, concerns, and feedback. That is at uh, the Charles Houston Rec Center. It's at 9.30 in the morning, and it is a hybrid event. Um, if you attend in person, you'll be able to submit questions. And uh, for uh, others who would like to just watch, I believe it will be streamed. Um, next, our next listening session next week will be Thursday, and it will be around transportation and traffic management. We are anticipating um, that in the coming days, we will have a lot of new information about the traffic and transportation plan that is being created by the Commonwealth and a advisor um, who has taken a lot of the inputs of this uh, of the proposed district and has been doing a traffic plan. So we will be sharing that information uh, as it's available before the listening session, and it certainly will be a topic of discussion. We anticipate having professionals from the Commonwealth and from our own city team available to answer questions and receive feedback. And then I uh, will also remind the community or maybe tell them for the first time um, that part of the engagement um, calendar that council has encouraged staff to provide is the ability to have pop-ups. And so to what that means is that there will be a table with some staff folks available to take comments and answer questions in community areas where people tend to gather. And so the first pop-up is going to be held next weekend, uh, February 3rd at the Leonard Chick Armstrong Rec Center. And um, so if you are in that community and so inclined, we would like to see you at that pop-up. We also have listed a number of other pop-ups that will be coming throughout February. They're on monumentalalx.com. And so with that, I will thank our panelists and thank our listeners and thank all of the attendees. And we will uh, see you at the next engagement opportunity. Have a great night. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.